my father never received a kind word from his father, but he was saved by the ultimate makerspace, his grandparents' farm. So my father tinkered his way to becoming an electric engineer. He even had time in university to take a selfie. I think he started the trend, don't you think? <laughs> This is one of the myriad uh, selfies that our daughter Carmen has taken. Um, our students seamlessly are existing in virtual and analog worlds, and they're sharing their lives and their learning in ways that you know, we could have only imagined. The way that we look for information has dramatically changed. But I wonder you know, what we're doing with this potential because now our students have the ability to have access to the world's ideas. But what are we doing? I fear that we're still creating zombie worksheet children. <laughs> There's an alternative. We need to be creating zombie fighting citizens. So at the Surrey Academy of Innovative Learning, Sale and Surrey Schools, uh, the brilliant educator Orwell Kowalshin and I support students' learning in our makerspace. Making happens at the access of head, heart, and hands, where students tinker, experiment, create, invent their way to learning. This happens through you know, skill acquisition, through learning challenges, and also through capstone projects. Because most students don't have access to this crazy place, an amazing you know, um, place with all kinds of tools, so we've created that for them in our school because it's basically one big making learning commons. But most of all, we're introducing them to the kind of knowledge that they need most in order to get more knowledge. Making is about learner empowerment. Because as Gary Steger says, the best makerspace is between your two ears. So design thinking really shapes our making. We empathize with a problem or a person, we define this problem, we iterate all kinds of solutions, then we create prototypes, we test them, and then repeat. So we're really creating a, a kind of a maker mindset toolkit for students that's filled with perseverance, grit, and creativity. And as we live in perpetual beta, we can fall down, get back up again, and start again. So I wouldn't have been able to explore the idea of wearable technology if I first hadn't been introduced to the traditional arts of sewing and embroidery by my grandmother and also by my mother. Because we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Making is in our DNA. It sustains us as human beings. So why in the world would you want to teach wearables? Wearables now, they track our health, they um, help us learn more about our fitness, and they're also really revolutionizing um, the world for people with, um, they're living with disabilities. They require a multiplicity of skills, and they exist at the intersection of science and art. So, when our students are creating a wearable bracelet project, to be able to have a circuit, the only idea of a circuit to be able to create a light to go on, because they've had to struggle with all the components and then with conductive thread to really create their own light bulb moment. Because making is joyful. I can't count the amount of times that students come to me and say, look what I made. So here's some of the projects that our students and, and I have done. All the learning design um, challenges that we give them are about constraint and also creativity. This year, we're going to challenge them to learn about sensors. Now, this is my super beta interactive nightlight to be able to guide the tooth fairy. It has, yes, yeah, super beta, believe me, it's super beta. And uh, it has a sensor on it. So when it becomes dark, um, the light comes on automatically, and then the light goes off um, at first light. So it has a lily pad uh, controller, and we code, we add in all the code, and then everything is connected up with conductive thread. So 
Makers, you know, teachers really need to experience the joy of making. Because can you imagine what we're going to create with our students if we know something about these new technologies? Also, all learners now, they really expect to be able to share their learning with the world. As my teacher librarian colleague Anna Croslin says, it's no longer good enough for students to take their work home in their backpacks. It needs to be shared on the global fridge. So assessment, people are always asking me about assessment, and we really look at process, understanding of concepts, and also the product that students are creating. Assessment is an ongoing conversation about their evolution as a maker, because every student has their own learning path. And if we are to give voice and choice to students, we need to trust them. Because given the challenge of making an igloo out of you know, hundreds and hundreds of milk jugs, they'll rise to the occasion to really think like an architect and collaborate together no matter how messy it gets. And believe me, it gets really messy. Sometimes making is messy. And then they'll be able to, they have the chance to be able to inhabit a space that they have created. Inspiration really comes from you know, collaborations between 3D designers and architects like the Star Lounge. And this, for me, really evokes you know, Islamic um, tile designs and also American quilts. Because collaboration fuels creation. Our students at SAIL challenge each other to think deeper and to design deeper. Because what happens when we start to think of students as creators instead of as mere consumers? In our capstone projects last year, one of our students was, in, was uh, exploring wearables in fashion, another one an Arduino supercomputer, and another um, looking at using coding to be able to make websites. They also did a series of maker workshops for an inner city school in Surrey. And in the um, Little Bits microcontroller workshop, one student made a finger massager. Who doesn't want a finger massager? I mean, come on. And also another student, an interactive story about a bank heist. I don't know what happened there, but that was it. That was her story she wanted to tell. And, but the really exciting thing was then afterwards, our students presented their educational findings and also their purchasing recommendations to community schools. Why can't students be involved in our research and our development and our purchasing, um, you know, situa purchasing um, process in our districts? So this whole experience of doing these workshops really made me think of the voices that are missing in the maker movement. Largely, the voices of women and people of color are, are missing in the technology industry. Because coding and computational thinking now really fuels many of the things that we use in the world. The creative syntax of coding teaches us critical thinking, problem solving, and also design. And it really is the literacy of creation and invention but look how long literacy was the gift to few in our society. Are we going to do the same with coding? Some call this a Rosie the Riveter moment. In the Second World War, courageous women left their traditional um, uh, roles and they learned how to make airplanes. I think it's important for all of us to learn coding and computational thinking. I'm learning coding, it's hurting my brain, but I'm doing it because it's really important to embrace all literacies. So in 2015, there was this crazy storm in my neighborhood. Everybody drove around Langley, the lights were out, they're trying to find restaurants, they were losing their crackers. But these three young gentlemen started to clean up because our neighborhood, because they realize if there's an emergency, we pitch in because that's what we do. 
So this made me start thinking about, oh, I want to put uh, you know, my students through an earthquake preparedness, um, you know, and I want to give them a tent and some you know, food, and I want them to make a meal for me, hopefully in the rain, because that will make it much more interesting. And we'll be able to see how they react um, as learners and as makers with this kind of you know, staged emergency. But this metaphor of shelter really can be linked uh, quite easily to the current migrant crisis. This is the first migrant crisis in the world where people have access to social media. The organization BBC Social Media, they created this really great film that I encourage you to watch, not right now though, thank you, on your phone, <laughs> and it's called Your Phone is Now a Refugee's Phone. And it asks the really strong question, what is the only one piece of technology that you would take with you if you had to flee your home? You can't look at your phone the same way after watching this film. So, talking last year, several of my students, they wanted to raise money for Syrian refugees. So they had a traditional Canadian bake sale, and they raised over $500, stuffed about 30 um, backpacks filled with school supplies for new Syrian refugees that are coming um, to Surrey schools. Not only are they makers, but they want to make a difference. We need to produce people who know how to react in situations for which they were not specifically trained. Because design should be a exploration of our humanity. You know, in the end, we're in this world full of technology, the most important thing is how we treat each other. So, what are we going to design? Perhaps an app to be able to help in integrate new migrants to Canada? or a wearable device like OrCam that reads out any text out loud and has facial recognition um, technology for blind people, the sky's the limit. Because once students are empowered with making, watch what happens. I think we all kind of think, what is our effect on the world going to be? So as my father is consumed with dementia, I think that he leaves behind a legacy as a maker and also generations of makers. And I think that's a pretty cool legacy. So I urge us all to make the space for all learners because you never know who you're going to save, just as my father was saved by my great-grandparents and their farm in Coldell, Alberta. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.